Conference recording has started. My name is Melvin Ortiz. I've been born and convicted for the murder of George Clouser. Incarcerated for 23 years. I've been set up by a politician's son. This is my story. Cuando lo sentenciaron, eso parece que se le acaba el mundo a uno, ver a un hijo sentenciado a vida. Hay un recuerdo específico. Esta es la, la primera foto cuando nos mudamos a Nueva York. Mm. Que ellos no habían visto la nieve por primera <risa> vez, estaban jugando ahí. Malvin era un niño como cualquiera otro, le, le gustaba jugar, jugaba con sus hermanos, le gustaba correr bicicleta. We used to wake up extra early and go to a swimming pool if he was there by a certain time. And you play for a baseball team, we got it there for free. We all got into the baseball. Melvin was not good at it. Alex was not good at it. I was the only one that was good at it. And, and his friends were all silly, like they were just so innocent, you know, they never got in trouble. He was a good kid, he always, you know, joke around, sometimes joke around too much. He was such a jokester. He was, he, he was so loyal, loyal to everybody, even if they weren't loyal to him. And unfortunately, you know, I think in the end, that's what really got him because he became friends with people that he should have never became friends with. Cuando vinimos, nos mudamos a Reading, uh, no estaba mal, estaba muy bueno. A nosotros nos gustaba. Pero a medida que pasaron los años, esto, las cosas fueron cambiando. Reading, Reading is a very dangerous place to be. It is very corrupt and there's racism everywhere in, in Reading, PA. If you're Hispanic or different race, they look at you different. You know, there was days I used to walk by with my friends, just walking by, you know, I was young. I only hear the car doors locks. Reading was probably one of the, is, is to date probably one of the most racist places I've ever been. When you talk about the corruption, you know, I think, I think about the victim. You know, why are, why are we even talking about this? Because a man died. Don't you have any concern for his family? Don't you have any concern for bringing the true um, assailants or conspirators to, to, to justice? The Reading Pizza Shop owner, George Clouser, was gunned down by two armed men during a botched robbery attempt here at Effie's Pizza Villa just two days before Christmas. The people of this neighborhood are trying to help police by offering a reward for their friend's killer. I remember, man, nobody knew who did it. I remember that time went by, they had no clue who was part of that. Who did that? Who was responsible? They had no, they didn't have not one suspect, not one name, no nothing. It seemed that the police, who thought Mr. Clouser was such a fine person and ran such a fine sandwich shop, and that they went to his sandwich shop, I didn't understand why they didn't spend more time investigating it. Because they were on the premise like 32 minutes. Nothing made sense much, you know. But then the people here were hit with yet another shocking blow as police arrest someone from right here in their own neighborhood, 18-year-old Melvin Ortiz, and charge him with the murder. I, I remember them saying it would be like finding a needle in a haystack because there's no gun, there's no nothing. So like, how do you go from a needle in a haystack to, hey, we got the guy? I'm like, what? Maybe, like, I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know what I was doing on that day. Not to Shannon, she looked at the day, she was like, yo, that's Isaiah's party. I was like, you for real? And she was like, yeah, you was here the whole time when this happened, look at the time. It was my son's second birthday. But there's no way he could have done it. He was at our house for one, and for two, he just never seemed like the type that would have that in him to do something like that. Nobody would leave a party to go commit a crime 
on the other side of town and then come back. It makes no sense. It's kind of hard to be gone for like, let's say an hour unnoticed. You know, I got my alibi, the guy Isaac, I got his wife, and, you know, other side of town, I have no worries, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it was like, yo, you know you can't trust these people. You don't have nothing to hide, so just go in, talk to them, and you'll be right back out. That was the last time he came back out. How can you have 20 people, a whole room full of people, saying that you were there? a place that's 20 minutes away mm -hmm. from where the crime was committed. They talked about the crime as if it would be a miracle if it was solved. Yeah. And then once they had Melvin in custody, it was pretty much, he, he was already guilty. I supposedly put it in God's hand. And 23 years later, I'm still in here. Not that my name get mixed with that. Melvin get involved sometimes I'll get questions like tell me again who the bad guy is you know the bad guy in this situation is John Caltagirone the son of the, the state politician I'm reading and John's name come up I was like what in the hell is going on the moment that I met John I told him this guy is not you can't trust this guy you got to be careful John and Javi had been talking John had come to visit the house and John told, they talk, he mentioned about the murder that happened and then he said, Melvin should be careful. At the time, I just thought that it was weird. Like, why would he say Melvin needs to be careful? This is the guy I've been to his house with. This is the guy that's been inside my house. We were close. I'm telling you, we had his back. Like, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. John Calchadrone coming forward and stating that Melvin had admitted to him that he had committed this crime. No, Melvin would never tell John that. No, Melvin would never trust. No, 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 no. No, no. If Melvin was going to tell anybody, if Melvin would have done it, he would have told one of his brothers. I would have definitely knew about it. My question is, how does he know so much about the crime? Was he there? Did he commit the crime? Mm -hmm. And then there was a, uh, I think there was like a $10,000 reward mm -hmm. for a conviction. I mean, maybe John did it for that. After they had posted that there was a reward, then, you know, that was when all of a sudden now he had information. Only until Melvin got arrested and John was the accuser. Then we were like, wait a minute. And then when Cynthia, had spoken to us, then she revealed to us why he did it. John gave a statement and included her in it. And, and in him including her, the cops, he had basically warned her that the cops were gonna come, that he gave her name. So when the cops came, he, they showed her pictures of the victim, of him burned. They told her that she was gonna go to jail, that she was gonna lose her kids. They told her that um, if she didn't testify, that all of this would be, uh, she would be held responsible or liable or something. Melvin's parents told me about it and she lived a block away and I knocked on her door and she knew why I was there. She said, you're here because, I know why you're here. And she said, you're here because of what I said. I said, yeah. And I said, what happened? And she started telling me that the whole thing is John. The whole thing was John. When she said that he came to her house and he told her that they would split, a, split the reward money, that they could accuse Melvin of it, that he wanted the money to go to Mexico. And basically she told me that they forced her to give a statement and they forced her to testify, that they were forcing her as a witness to what they had said. But she told me that it, everything was John, that John was the one responsible for everything. People aren't gonna be real forthcoming with information about this kid because maybe because of who his dad is. Thomas Caltagirone, he's the longest standing 
Democratic Judiciary House um, member in Pennsylvania. So his his job functions entail funneling money down from the Capitol into the sheriff's office, um, into the judge's office. The, the corruption really speaks for itself with John being arrested several times, or at least is a witness in crimes or is actually committed crimes, but never charged. About a couple months after the time of the murder, Thomas Calderon also had a conversation with the um, district attorney's office about disposing of an illegal firearm that he uh, that he received from his from his son. We learned that he got a lot of breaks from the police department over the years. You know, that's the kind of stuff that we would have loved to have gotten in front of a jury. We filed motions in limine asking for all that kind of stuff, and the judge denied it. The judge that oversaw Melvin's Melvin's original trial. Um, also would work with Thomas Caltagirone to erase his son, John Caltagirone's um, records. You have those three just come and kind of set, set the way for, for Melvin here to be, to be convicted. It was so open and shut and they thought that they had their man. Like, I just don't feel like it was there was like due process in any of it. They only called a few of us to the stand and there were a lot more people that um, said they would come forward and testify and they didn't use any of their testimony. When you have a party of like 20 people, why do they only interview like two? And the whole time we're on the witness stand, I kind of felt like I was being convicted myself. Like, uh, the DA, he was, he was a tough one. He would, he would, do whatever it takes to get the, the cases closed. Like for him, I think he just wanted to lock everybody up. That guy, he was just a monster. I wouldn't put anything past Mark Baldwin. His policies were off the charts, unethical. Um, they were uh, despicable. And I think it also amounted to unjustified results for a lot of people. He withheld evidence and had a witness lie to win the conviction. I was 72 hours away from being executed. You know, it's not just my case, it's hundreds, thousands of cases, not only across the country, but around the world that this is going on. And Mark Baldwin, he was a DA, I want to say for 16 years. How many cases did you handle and do this to in 16 years? 19-year-old Melvin Ortiz is looking at spending the rest of his life behind bars because in the state of Pennsylvania, a second-degree murder conviction carries a mandatory life sentence. Man, that was like a like an out-of-body experience, man. You know, when they say guilty, you know, it's like I heard it, but I didn't hear it. You know, and I, I was just like, like numb. I was shocked. I was like, how, 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 how am I being found guilty on this for crime I didn't commit? That was what got us as a shock. There was never a murder weapon found. Even the, the eyewitness said it wasn't Melvin. There's no gun. There's no DNA. There's no nothing. So now hearsay is new evidence. That's what hearsay is now. Hearsay is now a fact. It's no longer hearsay. Well, the evidence, you know, came down to what a couple guys, you know, and not real reputable guys. All these names are popping up that it's like, who in the hell tells a stranger, oh yeah, I did that robbery? Yeah. Who? It's impossible. Nobody does that to a stranger. You don't confess to someone you don't know. Who the hell is Calixto now? Uh, he was the quintessential jailhouse snitch, you know. Dear prosecutor, if you help me, I'll help you, you know. I he confessed his crime to me, you know, and, and, and let me, and I'm willing to testify. Now, he was a classic because he had done it so many times. That's not uncommon for Burst County Prison for some prisoner to say, hey, can I get a lesser sentence? I got some information for you. The case really did come down to John's testimony. I thought his testimony was ridiculous because the way he described Melvin was not the Melvin that I knew. His testimony was what led to Melvin's conviction cooperated at that time by by his then girlfriend anything that cast you know some doubt on that is big 
And if she comes in and says, yeah, it's not what happened and I lied and he made me lie, that would be, uh, that would be very big, I think. I lied. I stuck up for John, which wasn't true. Melvin had nothing to do with this crime. He was put there on a lie that I was just following what my ex was telling me to do. In 2005, I lost my son to SIDS. And I was like, you know what, I gotta make this right. You know, here's Melvin sitting in jail for a crime he did not deserve, nor do. So that hurt and pain I was feeling, I felt more like God put me up to it. And he handed me my karma back because here I was on a lie. I took him away from his dad, his mom, his brothers. So I just want to do the right thing and come forth. Why did you um, testify on John's behalf? It's scared, fear, not just from him, from his father. He had over me the power. He had over me the emotional, the mental, the physical abuse. His dad was no better. He, he was kind of the same way, very um, emotionally abusive. The night at FEC picked me up from work. I was about 15 at that time. He picked me up, he brought me back. I ended up then taking, I got my paycheck that day. I went to the outlets on 9th Street. I was walking back up through and, that, and John's speeding past the house. Now he's supposed to be at work, but he's flying past the house and everything and he came and he picked me up and told me to grab the bag behind the door. And I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what bag? And he's like, the bag behind the door. So I gave him the bag behind the door, gave it to him in his car. He had me get the gun, the hoodie, and the ski mask. I asked like what was going on and everything. Cause just his body demeanor was off. And I tried asking him everything. He's like, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. He was said he was going back into work at Boscov's because he had to work until like 8, 9 o'clock, something like that, that day. And then that evening is when he sat down with me more and told me what supposedly had happened. Him and Melvin supposedly went in and robbed the pizza shop. I didn't believe it because... One, Melvin was at a birthday party in Jamestown Village. Um, he had beat my beeper to see if John could give him a ride home from the birthday party. And John was going to go pick him up as soon as he was done work to go get him. Well, he beat back and then said, tell John that he, he was going to stay at the party. That all was said and done. John started opening up a little bit more to me. He's like, look. You are going to have to say this and say this and say this to get them off my ass. And they think it's Melvin that let them think that. What do you make you do with the hoodie and the gun? And the I threw it in, in over the um, Bigman Street Bridge. I threw it over into the Schuylkill River. But he threatened me that if it came out anyway or anything that I would be come after. John came to me. Um, about the trial stuff and told me I had to go by what he wanted said and that's how it was going to be where I would have issues. Going through it with my daughter, like going through it being pregnant with her and that, that was a lot. Me sitting there on stand saying that it was Melvin and I wholeheartedly knew that Melvin had nothing to do with any of this. John admitted that the gun just popped off nice and that he was scared to do it. It was John and another man. Melvin had nothing to do with it. He gave a name up a while ago, um, but the gentleman that he was talking about is now deceased. 
I remember standing in front of my house one day, and here comes Gary, and he sees me, and he stops in reverse, and he's just, come, get, get in the car, get in the car. Well, what's up? Get in the car, man, get in the car. I just want to tell you something. I get in the car, he starts taking off. As soon as he starts taking off, the first thing came out of his mouth was, I know your brother said it's in. I know your brother said it's in. And he starts crying. And he starts telling me that Junior, Jesus Lopez, was the one that killed Effie's because he needed money for drugs. That he was the one that did majority of those robberies that were going on in the bodegas and store, and he was the one responsible for that. Mm. He wanted to confess before he took his life. You know, George was a great guy. He gets me every time. <laughs> gets me every time. You know, I even said to myself, like, I'm gonna do my best not to cry. <laughs> not to cry. Because uh, it's just sad. You know, I really wish they would just find who did it and let Malvin out and get Effie the real closure that she needs, not the closure that she thinks she has. Pero yo voy a seguir luchando con, por mi hijo hasta el último minuto. Yo lo que me quiero morir, cuando yo muera, yo lo quiero ver aquí, antes de morir. You know, my conscience and my heart is, is clean. After all this, you know, I want, I want to find peace in my heart, peace in my mind, and, you know, be with my wife, you know, make her happy, you know I mean, make, them, make my parents happy, that even after all this, I can still do something with my life. It's scary, because if this can happen to anybody, this can happen to anybody, just grab a couple people, hey, listen, just say this, and, and I'm going to give you this. You know? Thank you for using... Secure us. Goodbye.